So thank you all for coming. Uh, this will be something completely different. Because when people are speaking about blockchains, they're mostly speaking about public blockchains and how to make them, how to scale them, how to use them. And this presentation will have some pretty opposite uh, views on this. And we'll see how it goes. I will be speaking about how to use a blockchain or how to embed the data in a blockchain structure which can be used for private projects. And we'll talk about how and why, we talk about uh, how to use it. I'll talk about the project which actually implements this, so it's not really it's only a talk about how something can be done, it's also a presentation of something that actually works. And we'll talk about some use cases for a system like this one. I've been uh, involved with blockchain development since 2014, mostly in low-level stuff like creating new blockchains, forking altcoins, forking uh, blockchains for private use. And basically, I've been working as a developer and I'm pretty much familiar with the technical side of how blockchains work. And this has enabled me to create some new ones and some interesting stuff in this area. Is there anybody here who didn't see this kind of picture? Is there anyone here who didn't see this, this diagram over here? Right? Hands up. Okay. So basically, this is the picture which everybody sees when he is searching blockchains. So if you search for blockchains in Google or whatever else, you will see this kind of image. You will see this kind of structure. So you have something called blocks. You have some uh, block hashes, uh, proof of work. You have some transactions. And this is basically what Bitcoin does. And this is why this kind of diagram, this kind of picture is pretty popular and pretty well known. On the other hand, uh, the blockchain as an idea is a bit more uh, flexible than this. So, we have cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin is the first globally popular cryptocurrency and it has set basically the standard of which uh, newer projects, newer cryptocurrencies, newer blockchains are made. And in some cases this is a good thing and in some cases it's maybe not so good. In essence, the minimal requirement for having a blockchain is to have some data. Let's say we group it in something called blocks and have this data referenced in a cryptographic way previous blocks. Basically, in a sense, they sign it. Or because new blocks are added to the end of the blockchain, each new block basically uh, vouches that every previous block is containing some data, is unchanged through time. This is the way, this is the thing which makes blockchains immutable, right? But this is a very basic structure. This is not a complicated structure, in a sense. So, um, all those talks about how to use a blockchain or, or how to adapt a blockchain to something uh, are mostly concentrated about how to adapt an existing cryptocurrency blockchain, whether it is Bitcoin or whether it is Ethereum or something else, to a new project. And it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be this way because the structure itself is simple enough to be created for specific purposes on the fly, let's say. Another thing I want to talk about, which is different from uh, existing blockchains, is proof of authority. The concept of using proof of authority for blockchains. Because uh, most of the talk, most of the hype even, is concentrated about proof of work, proof of stake, and such systems, which maintain a global consensus, a global uh, implementation of trust, or trustless system, depends on how you look at it. And this makes sense if you want to create a cryptocurrency or you wish to create a global system which is used by many, many different parties, like really globalism, all over the world. And those parties don't trust each other. But on the other hand, if you're going to use a blockchain for a relatively private purpose, meaning that, for example, you want to implement it uh, for uh, just a single organization or a single company, you'll see some examples later of this, it doesn't have to be this way. You don't need the overhead of using, for example, proof of work or such, let's say, complicated algorithms in order to have a blockchain, in order to have other useful properties of the blockchain. 
basically, I will be concentrating on a type of proof of authority where blocks are proven to be created by certain parties. That's the idea. So, we have blocks, we have data created in blocks, and those are cryptographically signed by certain parties, by certain keys. And by this, we trust them to be originating from certain sources. We trust them to be uh, pretty much, you know, certainly coming from certain sources, certain companies, certain organizations, certain institutions. And this is the important part here. So, in a common cryptocurrency blockchain, we have a list of transactions. And every such transaction is being signed by the issuer of this transaction. So, this leads to the fact that a block in a cryptocurrency setting can have thousands of transactions. Each of those are signed by, uh, could be signed by a different party, by a different key, by a different user or a different uh, member of the system, right? So, blocks in a traditional block cryptocurrency carry multiple, multiple data, each signed by its own creator, by its own issuer of the transaction. On the other hand, if you don't have such a system, if you have, for example, something which is uh, limited to a single institution, single organization or company, you basically have all those data generated within the same institution and you don't need to actually sign each and every record of it. You can just sign the whole block. And this is the type of proof of authority system I'm talking about here. This, of course, leads to the idea that um, trust in such blocks or the data in such blocks is pretty much centralized. We don't need the overhead of proof of work, for example, to trust such a system. The downside, of course, is that it is centralized. So, for example, if we have a security breach and somebody uh, steals or, or destroys the keys which create those blocks, it's pretty much game over. I mean, it doesn't have to be completely. We can mitigate this with, with certain actions. I will mention some of them later, but it's pretty much game over, right? So, um, if you're going to in inject any kind of useful data in an existing cryptocurrency, you will do this by attaching the data to transactions. If you have looked into how Ethereum works, you basically have transactions, which have pretty much the normal uh, data, data uh, records in them. So, for example, who is paying whom, which amount of money. We have uh, certain other properties, certain other uh, metadata which relates to the trans transactions. And attached to all this, we have actually user data. In Ethereum, this can be pretty much anything. This can be a smart contract. But the main idea is data is attached to a transaction in Ethereum. So, does it have to be this way, really? If you're having a project whose main purpose is to create data, not financial transactions, not um, transactions of, of some kind that when somebody is paying, paying someone a certain amount of money, you don't really need this overhead either. So what's the next step? How do you actually implement such a system which has a low overhead, when you don't have uh, thousands of transactions each signed by individual parties in a block, and actually make it useful. Maybe in a different set of problems, maybe for a different set of projects than those used by public blockchains. So this is the idea. If we have blocks, and blocks are signed by certain authors of these blocks, we can use a data format which suits us best. We can choose a data format which enables us to store the kind of information we want to store in it. We don't have to use an existing blockchain structure. We don't have to use an existing blockchain uh, type of um, data format or uh, network format or storage format or anything else. We can use something as simple as SQLite. So, this is a developer track, and this is a developer's topic. So, who knows what SQLite is? Raise your hand. So, pretty much everybody knows what SQLite is. It's an embedded, it's an embedded database library, and it enables you to create a whole database with tables, with indexes, with everything else in a single file. And you can query this file with SQL. 
You can, of course, add data to it with SQL, and you can query it later by using any kind of SQL statements on the single file database. So why not just you know, use this format for our blocks? It's pretty interesting, right? If you have a queryable database as blocks, then you can create a blockchain which holds pretty much arbitrary data, and more importantly, it can hold data in a format that you like, data in a format which you are able to use in a larger project. You don't have to adapt yourself to some esoteric data format which is used by Bitcoin or, or Ethereum or anything else, right? You can publish data in the sense, in a type of format which suits your project best. And this is the idea. This is the idea I'm presenting here in the form of the DAISY project. Um, data in the blockchain is, of course, immutable once added to the blockchain. So this is also the case here. We have new blocks, which are SQLite databases. We can create them, we can modify them, we can add data to them. But once they are inserted into the blockchain, the data stays that way. The data is signed. The data is integrated into the structure of the blockchain, and it remains this way. It's immutable from that point onward. So uh, the rest of the presentation will present a practical system which already exists. This is a project I've been working on for some time now. Uh, those of you who have the inclination can look at it on GitHub. And basically, DAISY is a blockchain of SQLite databases. It is a system which I've described here. So some of the features which you can use in your own projects or some of the features that can be applied to uh, a very large span of projects are that it can store arbitrary data in a format which suits the application best. It can also, uh, it also has a key management feature which enables that the set of initial uh, nodes which are, which are allowed to create blocks because this is proof of authority, so blocks will only be able to create it by a certain set of uh, uh, signatories or a certain set of nodes which have the appropriate authority. With the key management which is integrated into DAISY, this set of authorities can grow. So we can add new nodes which create data or add data to the blockchain. Uh, it is also a framework for creating blockchain in the sense that there's, there's really no need to be just one single DAISY blockchain. Each application, each company, each project can create its own blockchain for its own purpose, right? This is also important because you don't need to modify code, you don't need to fork anything to create your own blockchain. This is going into the direction of a blockchain as a framework rather, rather than a blockchain as a monolithic product which is used or not by a single project. Um, some details are that it uses uh, DHT to discover peers. Um, and the last bullet point here is particularly important to me because it's sort of a usability feature. You can query the whole blockchain with a single SQL statement. This, of course, comes with, comes with certain, um, let's say, limitations because you cannot really query the whole blockchain in a query which, which for example, um, at least in the current implementation, which spans, which, which uses data from, from tables from multiple blocks at the same time. For example, if you, you cannot currently do a distinct query or, or the whole blockchain, right, because the query is execu executed on each database individually. But this is something which is a mostly implementation detail at this point. This is something which could be changed in, your, in the near future. Um, DAISY is implemented in the Go language. I think you can hear me, right? DAISY is implemented in the Go language because it's fast, because it's scalable, because it allows uh, elegant concurrency in creating such software. And this is something I have experienced with previous project, projects, so the choice was pretty much uh, obvious. It also uses a JSON-based protocol, so it's easy to interface with. So if you create an application which uses, for example, DAISY like this, you can pretty much interface with the DAISY network using JSON, which is pretty cool. I mean, 
other blockchains also have this feature. It is not certainly a unique feature for DAISY, but it is an important step for integration into existing applications or being, for being used in a new project. Um, Escalate, as I said, is a major part of DAISY. And also because external applications can read the blockchain themselves. So you're not tied in to interfacing with the blockchain data through DAISY itself. Once the blockchain is, for example, downloaded and is present on uh, a disk drive, you can really just use any kind of application which already uses SQLite or any kind of library which uses SQLite to read the da data from the blockchain directly. Of course, you must not modify the data because then hashes and digital signature will be modified and, and not match the previous values. But, for example, if you have an application and want to add blockchain functionality to it, this is easy with DAISY. Basically, you can interface with the blockchain through DAISY, or you can interface with the blockchain directly by reading the Escalate files. And this is also an important feature for something like this. Some use cases. Of course, this is the most standard use case for blockchains ever. If you have some kind of official records that you wish to uh, present to the world, it's a natural solution for a thing that for data which is created by a single authority or a tightly, tightly coupled uh, group of authorities, you can create data in government institutions which contain, for example, ID information, which, create, which contain, for example, uh, you know, land owning records, which, you know, maybe even medical records in some way, and then distribute this data as a blockchain to the wider world. This is basically possible as an idea of the blockchain itself. Another use case, and this is a project which may uh, actually be, real, be realized in a few months, let's say. For example, if you have an application which is used by a large number of people, let's say that this is an online game, and this online ga game has some kind of a marketplace, but it doesn't have to be a marketplace. It, it can really be any kind of interaction between the players which can be stored in a, in a set of records, in a tabular way. You can create a blockchain as a means of publishing this data, these interactions between players, these maybe monetary financial transactions in a way for virtual currencies in, in games and something like this, to the world, so the world can verify that those transactions are okay, that, they, they, that those transactions are correct, and that those transactions are actually uh, being done in a way which is advertised to the players. So as a way of verifying that the company is not cheating. When you have a large online community doing the same, uh, playing the same game or, or doing some kind of interaction, it, it is very important that your image to the players, to the wider world, is that you are not cheating. Right? And one way of doing this is to publish the data of these transactions through a blockchain. So this data is signed by the game company, for example, and can be verified by every other user who chooses to do so, if it's published as a blockchain to the outside world. Another use case is for distributing sensor data. So imagine that you have a group of spoken wheel or star topology systems where there is a single component which is connected to the internet, and you have multiple sensors which are weak enough but connect to the central component. This central component can publish the sensor data, for example, every 10 minutes or every half hour or even every one minute, and this data can be visible as a part of the blockchain basically to the whole world, right? This is also an interesting use case when there is a small set of authorities which publishes data, and this data can be accessed, verified, used by basically everyone on the whole world. Also, in the same uh, area of, of application, for example, institutions like CERN, CERN and other such scientific institutions, uh, maybe genome sequencing uh, institutions or companies, create a huge volume of data. 
and this volume of data needs to be published in some way to make it usable to other researchers. It can be done, for example, by just hosting files on a web server and you know, making them available for download. But if you put this kind of data in a blockchain structure, you get also another useful property. And this, this is that the data can be updated pretty much uh, universally or pretty much you know, automatically. So for example, you can create a set of, if you're speaking about the genome researching project, you can have a set of uh, data which covers certain cells or certain uh, organisms. And then you can later add new data to it in the form of new blocks at the end of the blockchain. And those blo blocks will be automatically distributed to every other research institution, to every other users of such data, which is also a useful property. And of course, there's the issue of logging and auditing, because DAISY supports you know, creating a bulk amount of data. You can literally save gigabytes and terabytes of data in DAISY because it's a private blockchain, because it's basically a database. It's the most database use of blockchain, right? Uh, you can store data which needs to be signed off by a single party, for example, by company which vouches that it is the data belonging to a certain uh, service or data belonging to a certain uh, area which is under some compliance rule for, for auditing. And by using a blockchain, this data becomes immediately immutable. So in case of DAISY, the data is authenticated. It is uh, signed, digitally signed by a certain party, for example, the company itself. And it is also immutable because it is stored in a blockchain format, which reference, which, where each block references the, pri the previous block and so on and so on. Um, scalability of blockchains is a hot topic today because uh, when using blockchains as uh, a method of payment, for a method of transactions, most of the current popular blockchains are not really there in terms of performance, right? And the situation is getting worse as more and more companies, more and more projects are dumping their own data into public blockchains. Every single token on Ethereum, every single project which uses, uh, uh, for example, Ethereum, because it's the most popular one, which uses the Ethereum's blockchains for storing its own project data, is basically dumping, let's say, private data into the blockchain, into the public blockchain, which makes it grow. So something like this, something like the framework for blockchains that I've described could be used by, you know, companies willing to uh, or having the need to publish data in the blockchain format and not at the same time spam the public blockchains and leave them for you know, intent, their intended use or maybe a more, uh, more smarter, smarter use than, than dumping data in them. Uh, a few notes about proof of authority. So, as you have maybe realized with the examples I've given, DAISY is basically uh, best suited for the cases where there is a small amount of publishers, small number of nodes which publish, publish authenticated data to the wider world. So whenever you have a small amount of, small number of publishers, and it doesn't have to be small in the terms of, you know, one to 10, it can really be thousands. But the issue is, it's not really globally writable. In every, in every case which, which you have a situation where data is not globally writable, but is writable by a small, small control number of nodes, this sort of system which uses proof of authority principle is really efficient. Because there's no uh, waste of electricity by using proof of work. There's no, um, let's say, security uncertainty with using proof of, proof of share. Proof of stake, sorry. And there really is not, you, don't, you really don't need to uh, modify your data or the way you interact with the blockchain to adapt to an existing product, to an existing data structures, to an existing blockchain like Ethereum. You can just, you know, publish the data in your own format, in your own way. DAISY doesn't implement a cryptocurrency. 
it's a blockchain, yes. It's, uh, it can be public, everybody can read it. The blocks are distributed in a peer-to-peer -peer network, yes. It doesn't implement a cryptocurrency. This is, of course, possible because the minimum rule for, for blockchain is that you, know, you have a structure of blocks which reference each other or sign each other. So this makes it extensible in a way that you can really put any kind of data in the, block, in, in the DAISY blockchain itself. It can be adapted to be a cryptocurrency. There's a pretty small number of changes which need to be added to, data, to DAISY, for example, to make it a cryptocurrency blockchain. Because once you have solved the, pro solved the problem of, of you know, having a blockchain and heavy data in the blockchain, exactly what type of data you put in the blockchain, it's a small issue, and it can be a cryptocurrency. You can add features like smart contracts in DAISY, but uh, unless you also do the cryptocurrency layer, this concept of smart contracts in DAISY, it's a bit different. Because in DAISY, there are no transactions, there are no addresses. You, know, you can just dump data in it. And Smart contracts in themselves are actually, you know, program code embedded in a blockchain. So this program code can access all the data in the blockchain in itself. In case of DAISY, for example, this smart contract will probably execute SQL functions, SQL uh, statements, right? Not really something which is done in, on, in Solidity today and, you know, such systems, which makes it really interesting to do. Um, so thank you very much. If you're a developer, you can see more about Daisy on this link. And if you have any more questions, please ask them here. Thank you. Yes. And could you kind of emphasize the, the main problem in querying this on really complex uh, data? Okay. So the question is how does this system compare to really just querying uh, a database with SQL? And how does it compare to other such systems when using complex SQL queries? Okay. So for the first part, if you go through DAISY, you can issue an SQL query which will be executed on each and every block in the blockchain. So, for example, uh, you can get, uh, if you're storing some kind of uh, records in the blockchain, let's say they are cryptocurrency-like records, just for simplicity because everybody knows what, what cryptocurrency records approximately contain. So they contain, you know, for example, uh, a from address, a to address, a value. You can, you can issue a statement like select everything from, from a transaction table where a from address is whatever. And this query will be executed on all the blocks in the chain and the results will be uh, presented to you, to your application. This, of course, can be inefficient if there are millions of blocks, right? So some kind of optimization will be uh, placed in order to do this. The other thing is, for really complex queries, SQLite itself does support pretty complex query elements, SQL statement elements. Uh, currently, each such query is executed, executed on each block individually. So for example, if you have some data which, as a part of the query, relies on a data in a different block, right, uh, it, the query will not execute as if it's all a monolithic database, right? So, for example, if a query uh, has some kind of, let's say, foreign key relationship to data which is in a different block, this kind of query will uh, not work as originally planned. I have some ideas how to modify this, how to improve this, but currently each query is executed on each block in the blockchain individually. Okay. Thank you. More questions? Okay. Those two gentlemen. Um, I, um, you mentioned ways in, in which this, this could be extended. Uh, do you see a plausible scenario to extend it to uh, into really um, a public blockchain for storing uh, uh, large amounts of data? 
Yeah, sure. So the question is, if DAISY can be extended enough to be a public blockchain for storing large amounts of data? The answer is yes. It's pretty much trivially it. So this is already present in DAISY. It doesn't have to be much extended for this. Maybe a few tweaks for performance and, and such stuff. But the idea is, uh, would you like to have a public blockchain which holds terabytes of data? Maybe you do. And if you do, fine, you can do it. No, no, absolutely no technical difficulties currently present. But it will be maybe more efficient. I mean, if you are really t the type of organization that, that publishes a large amount of data, you know, each uh, day or each year or something like this, perfect. Right. But if you are such type of, of organization and want to dump all this data in the public blockchain, where it is downloaded by people who don't really need your data, but must download it because you know it's a blockchain. You, they need to download everything. Maybe you don't want to go into, into this direction. In this case, maybe it will be more efficient to just create your own blockchain from this kind of framework and dump your data in it and leave the public blockchain for something, you know, which is more uh, interactive with the global audience. Okay, next question. Thanks. Uh, so, I'm not sure if I understood correctly. So, there, there's a number of people that we sort of sign blocks, right? And uh, I can't trouble like, tra transitioning from the sort of Ethereum state of mind where, where you have a pool of transactions and peers that sort of submit transactions. Does AC support that kind of behavior, like uh, peers that just sort, sort of send data? Or is the data upload just not the peers that actually have the prior key to sign blocks? Okay, so the question is, how does DAISY compare to traditional blockchains, for example, Ethereum? In Ethereum, you have, for example, a pool of transactions, and those transactions go into a block, and basically every miner can create their own block with those transactions and publish them. So the idea here is that um, most purposes where you, are, where you are using data as a company, as a single organization, don't require the overhead you have with this kind of structures. D doesn't require the overhead you have with proof of work mining and you know, uh, trusting other miners and, and such things. So you basically trust the organization, right? Of course, there are security issues, as I said, you know, in this case. But uh, in DAISY and basically all proof of authority systems, so this is not really uh, limited to DAISY itself, uh, you have a group of nodes which are authorized to create new blocks, right? And everybody else can read them. So this data gets distributed all over the world, like in traditional blockchains. Everyone, you know, if you allow it, everybody can uh, be a full node, everybody, everybody can download the data, but a limited number of nodes can create them. Limited number of nodes are miners. There's no proof of work here, so this, this is all handled by digital signatures, right? Uh, so, uh, basically, it's ideal if a certain project needs to publish huge volumes of data to you know, the whole world or to see, to inspect or to verify or to validate if it's correct. Okay. Any more questions? How do you deal with the block size? Is it dynamic to support any yes. database? Yes. The question is how do I deal with block, block size? Uh, it's dynamic because the purpose of DAISY is to enable you know, projects to dump huge, amount of, huge amounts of data in a blockchain structure and distribute them all over the world. So it is necessary that the blockchain block size sorry, in the blockchain is not really limited by anything because you cannot predict that you know, some organization or some project will you know, only fit its data in whatever size you have. You know, it can be a gigabyte, but you know, there will be some kind of project which needs gigabyte and a half, and you know, it falls apart. So the block size is really uh, not limited because, and, and this is possible because uh, this is not really meant to be uh, a type of blockchain, a type of public blockchain like Ethereum, like Bitcoin, which is you know usable by multiple parties which all write and read at the same time to it. If you distribute scientific data to, to this kind of project, or you, you distribute, it doesn't have to be scientific data, it can be data from stock markets, 
right? It can be end, end results of daily trades. You can publish them each day in such a format and have it immediately distributed all over the world, right? So not everybody is interested. For example, if you dumped all this data in Ethereum, so not everybody is interested in this data. Only a smart, certain set of people are, are really interested in, in those data, right? And just use to distribute huge volumes of you know, data which is a limited use to is not really efficient. You can use a private blockchain, you can use a system which is under your control, right? And still have the benefits of the blockchain which are you know, data immutability and the, the easy and automatic distribution of data to all the interested parties all over the world. Okay, last question. So the question is, is there a built-in mechanism to, um, to tackle or, or to uh, contribute to solving integrity issues in case, if I understand you correctly, one of the publishers is compromised, right? Or no? No, okay. so, so if central data gets changed, but think about what it means. So if you have, for example, a blockchain of, I don't know, 100,000 blocks, and somebody in the middle changes you know, one of the first thousand blocks or whatever, or any kind of block, any number of, any block in the whole blockchain, because it's a blockchain, because each new block contains a hash of the previous block, this kind of change will be trivially visible to every <coughs> node in the question. Another question is the integrity of the chain. Right? But the integrity of data, because if you're using this database, yeah. one of the key guidelines, yeah. Do you mean integrity data? All the data do you mean like semantic integrity of the data, or do you mean like file corruption type of integrity? Like uh, foreign keys and acid yeah. and such stuff. Yes. Okay, so since each block is basically an SQL database, within each block you can have as far as SQLite supports it, uh, for in integrity for this, for this block, right? Currently, there is no foreign key integrity or any such kind of uh, um, data integrity schemes across blocks. So you cannot have a record in one block which references data in another block. By using automatic mechanisms like, like uh, database style foreign keys. Okay, so within a block, it is possible. Across blocks, it's currently not possible. Okay. Maybe there's a way to solve it. This is uh, still a work in progress, but this is the current state of the things. Um, okay, now the really last question. Sorry. Please. I understand correctly this is a distributed network, right? This is a distributed B2P network. Right? Yes, and yeah. uh, how do you solve uh, master map? Yes. So how do you solve uh, conflicts? Okay. So the question is how do you solve conflicts in uh, what is basically a master-to-master -master database, which a P2P database, which uh, the set in the set of nodes which create new blocks, each of them can create this block independently and then publish it to the network. So uh, basically, because I'm not aiming here for, uh, you know, for uh, millions of nodes which can create new blocks, blockchains. Resolution within those blocks can, within the set of, of uh, block creators, can happen with a known algorithm, for example, Paxos or something else, which simulates some kind of master-to-master -master if there is a need for this, if 
there's really so much, uh, so large uh, block creation rate that they must synchronize some way, right? Then you can choose masters and then masters can create new blocks, right? This is the logic. Yes, this is the other thing. So, for example, uh, the aim here is basically to simulate or to implement uh, the longest chain rule in such a system. So, for example, if there really is a situation where multiple nodes create new blocks simultaneously at the same height, right? And in, if by some chance they continue to create new blocks on top of those, you know, orphan blocks, the idea is to implement the same kind of resolution as, for example, Bitcoin does and other cryptocurrency network does do. And this is basically, you know, searching for the longest chain. Uh, this is basically something which, you know, depends on the rate of the creation of new blocks, I think. Is it sort of an answer? No. Okay. We can talk about it later. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you for listening to all this and see you.